Welcome back. Welcome back. I know I was off for a couple weeks, had to take care of some stuff, but I am back. Uh, better than ever, got a, a host that's uh, a friend of mine who's pretty much uh, grew up with me. I've been knowing him since I was like in high school, but watching him since I was in high school. He's been my big bro. He's literally the person that everybody said that he's my big brother because we both tall, light skinned, with freckles. <laughs> <laughs> my, my my boy, my boy Keith Kloss is here. I'm your host for the show, Athlete's Journey, Travis Reed. Say what's up to the people, Keith. What's good, everybody? What's good? <laughs> He's a blessing. Yep. This I used to work out with him all the time. You know, he used to dunk it so easy, make me mad. <laughs> you know. Has a had a, a great lustrous career over, you know, in the NBA, overseas, all that. So we're going to let him get into his journey. And let's just get right into it, Keith. How did your journey start of uh, basketball? Man, crate ball in a project. You know, I was born I was born in Hartford, Connecticut. I lived there until I was five, then moved to L.A. But, you know, we all played crate ball outside. Myself, Marcus Camby, and a few other guys who were from, from the community. Uh, everybody knows Marcus. You know, former defensive player of the year in the NBA, mm -hmm. had a great career. You know, uh, one of the all-time leading defenders. You know, out of the you know representing for the big men in mm -hmm. the NBA. You know, uh, that was my sandbox mate right there. You know, um, but yeah, everywhere I went growing up, man, I had a basketball in my hand. Drove my mother crazy. <laughs> I'm always dribbling. You know, I'm always dribbling the basketball wherever I went. I'm taking out the trash. I got my ball. I'm going to get the mail. I got my ball. We're going to the grocery store. Laundromat. I got my ball. You know what I'm saying? But, uh, yeah, basketball, man, that's always been my love, my passion, you know? And uh, whenever you saw me, you saw my ball with me, you know? That's, uh, that's, that's, that's how it starts, you know. man. That's how it starts. It's just the dedication yeah, the right same. there. You hear the saying, ball is light, and it really was, you know, for mm -hmm. me. No, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Were you interested in any other sports growing up? Football. Football? Yeah, football. man, football. I'm a, I'm a big time. Uh, I'm, I'm the world's tallest Pittsburgh Steelers fan. You know? <laughs> yeah, so I got to holler at them about getting some apparel, man, so I can rep them right, you know, get some <laughs> stuff that will fit me. You know what I'm saying? But – uh. Yeah, the Steelers, man. That's my that's my favorite team. You know, when I was about two, three years old, one of my uncles was playing Pop Warner for the Steelers. Mm -hmm. He had also mm -hmm. played he had also played Pop Warner for the Bengals and for some other team that just had a plain white helmet. And, you know, they said that one day he had all three of his helmets sitting out on the table. And I just picked up the Steelers helmet, put it on, got down a little three point stance and started ramming all the grandma's furniture. <laughs> you know, and, so that's where my love for the Steelers was born. You know what I'm saying? That's a heck of a story, man. That's a heck of a story. Moms wouldn't let me play football, though. You know, she said I was too skinny. They was going to hurt me. So I did like every other kid. You know, I went out to the street and played football in the street, played tackle football at the playground. You know, just had a blast with it. <laughs> that's as close as I got. That's as close as I got to the NFL. Street football and playground football. That's it. I got you. I got you. I got you. Check. I played. I played uh, like t flag, and then a little bit of pop one. I got hit when I caught the ball as a receiver, and I was like, "Oh no, that ain't me no more. I'm gonna stick with this basketball thing. Basketball and baseball is my sport." <laughs> <laughs> Man, now did hey, you? I, I had a blast out there though. You know, oh, yeah? We had no pads, no nothing. We we tearing up side view mirrors on cars. You know, hey. I got you. So did you grow up in the AAU circuit going, you know, growing up through uh, ball or did you just play, uh, you know, the street ball into high school? No, I did. Uh, I got into AAU my sophomore year of high school, you know, um, playing with uh, Slam and Jam. Well, first, my first, actually, my first AAU coach was out of, out of Covina. Uh, his name is Jim Espinosa. He was a retired sheriff's deputy. And mm -hmm. um, I played on the freshman team at Charter Oak, my freshman year of high school with his son, James Espinosa. 
And uh, you remember Jerron Roberts from Charter Oak yeah. that went to uh, Wyoming? Yeah, we were all teammates, man. And um, they were my introduction to AAU. And after that, you know, along with playing for them, I played with uh, Slam and Jam, you know, Izzy. Uh, I played Izzy Washington, you know what I'm saying? I did the whole, you know, gambit with the pumps. I played for Reebok. I played for Adidas. I played for Nike. You know, I had a blast out there, man. ARC. Just yeah, really yeah. Long, that's you know. how I was. I was on ARC with the, with Jason and Jaren Collins. That was that we was on a little yeah. team. Rockfish yeah. with Aaron yeah. Maxey, Andre Miller. Yeah. People don't forget that Rockfish should have had some dudes, man. Rockfish should have had a couple of NBA pros, man. The Rockfish should have right. had some players. Yo, I was a 6'11", two-man playing for Rockfish. <laughs> <laughs> with Dre Miller running the point. So That's imagine crazy. me coming That's off the screen, crazy. knocking down 25 footers. <laughs> <laughs> I got Man you. on the rock, breaking, breaking presses like it was nothing. Mm -hmm. I got you. So you went to Charter Oak all four years in high school, right? What's that? You went to Charter Oak all four years? No, nah, just my freshman year. Uh, after that, I went to Sierra Vista in Baldwin Park. Um, and finished up there. I played only one year varsity because uh sophomore year to be honest, I wasn't I wasn't quite ready for varsity yet. Mm -hmm. And uh but that you know, and that's when I first really started dunking in AAU, you know, and really getting that confidence going up against all these dudes who are ranked. You mm -hmm. know, the Mike Carsons and Keith Van Horns and everybody, Alex Sanchez, you know, the name Jack Vaughn to name a few. Yeah, Cam, yeah. Cam Murray, you know, mm -hmm. Jelani Gardner, those guys. So, uh, you know, my my junior year in high school, the coach didn't let me – he wouldn't even let me try out for the team. You know, I'm 6'11". He told me he had enough talent on the team and that he didn't need me. And so what ended up happening is they went 0-24 that year, lost every game. Yeah, me and, me and the dudes that didn't play, but some of the players didn't go back. They didn't like them, so they didn't go back. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went to every game and heckled them. You know, we heckled the coach. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Home games, away games. We sitting, we sit at away games. We sitting with the home team. You know, with the home crowd clowning and, and, and heckling. You know, we used to draw, we used to draw signs and take them up in there, have pictures <laughs> of them holding holding the clipboard in one hand and doing a doing a defensive slide, you know, with the whistle hanging out of his mouth, just getting our clown on. So, you know, as you can probably guess, after going 0 and 24, he didn't come back. Yeah. So yeah, I imagine. I you know, imagine. That, yeah. The athletic director took over my senior year. And um, you know, I got my one year in. But, you know, I'm grateful for AAU because that's what kept me active. You know what I'm saying, and really, and really kept my face and my name out there. Okay, okay. What would you say your most memorable moment in high school was? Out of those most memorable years? moment in high school. Oh man, uh, I forgot who we were playing against. Maybe Chino High School in a tournament. I had 34 points, 32 rebounds, and 28 blocks. Damn. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a heck of a everything up out of there. That's a hell of a triple double, right? <laughs> right. That might be the best triple double I've ever heard of. <laughs> right. Right. You trying to compare, that? you know, I'm trying to compete with Wilt. <laughs> no, right. That's a Wilt Chamberlain, Cream of Jabbar high school triple double. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. So you play your one year in um, your senior year. Uh, do you get it recruited from any, any colleges, anything like that? I got recruited by, uh, UCLA, USC, Cal Berkeley, Pepperdine, Lola Marymount, Michigan, Michigan State, UConn, Florida, uh, Ohio State, Alabama. I got I got recruited by Long Beach State, of course. You know, uh, Utah. Coach Majerus was was high on my list. I really liked his uh his attitude and his approach towards things. You know. Mm -hmm. Coach mm -hmm. Seth Greenberg down at Long Beach State. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what happened was, I was I was so 
I was so just I was so turned off by the coach my 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 junior year that I basically said screw it, you know as far as school is concerned. I only took the test. I ain't turned in any homework assignments or anything, you know. And because of that, my GPA had dropped. So they weren't thinking that I was going to graduate from high school. And uh, a lot of people started to fall off, thinking that I wouldn't be able to make up the credits. So my senior year, I basically went to school, man, from 7 in the morning until 10 o'clock, 1030 at night, because I go to the adult school immediately after school and make up all those credits. And I ended up, you know, graduating in uh, Central Connecticut. They, they stood tall with me, man, from, from beginning to end. You know, they really believed in me and mm -hmm. kept encouraging me. My coach there, Mark Adams, and his coaching staff, you know, um, Ted Wilward and Mark Borgeson, they really stayed, you know, in my corner and kept encouraging me to just push through it, you know, that I could do it. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I knocked it out, man. You know, and the few teams that were still around at the end, they wanted me to red shirt. And I wasn't feeling it, you know, because of my high metabolism. Everybody thought, oh, we just feed him, feed him, feed him, and he's going to gain the weight, you know. But my dad, six, seven, 180 pounds, you know what I'm saying? So we not we not maintaining no kind of weight here, <laughs> you feel me? And uh, it's a, so Central, they told me, we're not going to redshirt you. We're going to throw you in a fire right away because we believe you can compete, you know. And so I... I signed with Central Connecticut State University, man. It was the best decision ever made. You know, it's, it's nothing like having a coaching staff that believes in you. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And having the right people around you to to constantly give you the encouragement that's needed, especially when you're far from home. Yeah, I'm born in Connecticut, but I'm raised in Los Angeles, you know. And even though I went back during the summers and whatnot to visit family, now I have to reacclimate myself to that cold ass winter weather, you know, <laughs> and, and and the college lifestyle. So, you know, I'm very grateful to Coach Adams and his coaching staff, you know, Doug Leishner, Mark, Mark Borgeson, Ted Woodward. I'm grateful as hell for those for those guys, you know, because uh they they really helped me out a lot. No, I hear you, I hear you on that, man. I remember that, like when UCLA, I was like, once they start recruiting me, I was like, you know, I was in between UCLA, Arizona, Long Beach State. And yeah. I was like, I like you. I love you, Arizona. I love you, Lou Dawson. But Lucy, UCLA, my dream school. I love you, Wayne Morgan, but UCLA, my dream school. I can't right. I can't pass up my right. dream school, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, you know, I would have went to Utah or Long Beach State, but just, just the way that the Central Connecticut State staff came at me correct, man, you know, I, it only made it only made sense. No, no, I get it, bro. I, I mean, like I said, they stay solid with you the whole time, and you want to you want to get that trust with college, you know. Yeah, and I still got a great relationship with those guys today. Okay, you know, with, with my cool. coaches. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I love them to death, man. And you know, the thing about Coach Adams from Central Connecticut was he cared more about you as a man, as an individual than he did at, uh, you know, about your basketball prowess. You know what I'm saying? He wanted to make, he wanted to make sure he was dealing with men and teaching men how mm -hmm. to be men, you mm -hmm. know? So he was a great example for us in that, in that area. And so were his assistant coaches, you know, and he kept us accountable for our behavior. You know, mm -hmm. I, I got suspended from the team, man. Um, after the first week of school, cause you know, everybody know I had a drinking problem and everything and all. Uh, you know, I got drunk the first big house party of the year and, um, you know, caught a charge for going into the wrong house. And uh, he suspended me indefinitely. So he had me, you know, keeping me accountable, you know, let me know, hey, this is unacceptable. We love mm -hmm. you. We want you here, but this ain't going to be tolerated. This is not what we're going to accept from our from our student athletes, you know. And this man had me up every morning at five o'clock in the morning running through through the city and this is when the first big snowfall started so you know here i am seven foot two 
180 pounds soaking wet, you know, running five o'clock in the morning in the snow. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I had to chase Coach Leisner around. I had to follow him around, you know, through the city. And then, all right, go ahead and get ready for class. Oh. You know? And oh. that was every day. And that was every day until he was satisfied that I had learned my lesson. Right, you know? right, right, right. But uh, I, I, I've learned to appreciate that, man, you know. And so today, even today, I'm, I'm really big on accountability, and I teach it to uh, all the youth that I interact with. Okay. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. So what do you remember about your first year at college? What was, the, like, the biggest difference between college and high school? Oh, man, having to go all the way across campus to these different classes, you know, because I stayed on one side of campus, and, you know, all the classes were way on the other side of campus. So right, having to figure right, out, right. You know, the best time to leave and, you know, so I can get there in time, you know, will I have time to eat breakfast, you know what I'm saying, or will I have time to eat lunch before the next class, you know. It was, it was just things like that. Um, the atmosphere was great. You know, my, my teammates were great. You know, a lot of those dudes to death, we're still in touch to this day as well. Mm -hmm. The men's team, the women's team, and the football team, you know. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, all three of those teams, we hung real tough mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we were inseparable, mm -hmm. you know, and these are relationships that last a lifetime, man. You know, we, we celebrate every every uh, event that someone has. You know, we celebrate each other's kids, you know, what, what they're doing, their accomplishments. You know, one of, one of the women's players, Yolanda uh, Bronson, she won a state championship as a as a high school basketball coach, you know. And we just celebrated that with her, you know, when when the other when the other players, their kids are graduating from high school. We celebrate that with them when they've got all these different accolades. You know, we celebrate mm -hmm. them, man, because we're all one big family. You oh, know, oh, that's cool, man. Like I said, it's all it's always love when you have like, you know, like really close knit, you know, team. And, uh, you know, for myself, you know, I most of my friends from UCLA and Long Beach, you know, still keep a contact with, you know, not all, but, you know, but most of them, you know, more UCLA than the Long Beach friends, but I still talk to both of them anyway. But yeah, I know having that brotherhood is there because you go through something, you know? Um, yeah. I guess I would, I would, my next question would be like, what's your, what was your biggest triumph and your biggest failure in college? My biggest triumph in college was um, leading the nation in shot blocking my freshman and sophomore year, you know, the two years that I was there. I you remember know? that. I remember that. Yeah. You were having like five blocks a game or something like that? Yeah, five, five point two one my freshman year, something like that. Five, five something. And then my sophomore year, 6.4. Yeah, so, was, you know, I, I still got like the career average. Yeah, I still got After career. about one or two, I'm like, okay, maybe I should not shoot around him or something. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, those records still stand today. You know, I still got the, the career average record. Oh, ain't nobody going to break no six, six blocks a game, man. <laughs> Come on. And, hey, you know, when we when we played against the big schools, Ohio State, Alabama, UConn, Penn State, you know, I'm averaging eight, nine blocks a game against them. Okay. You know, so even to show, you know, the big schools that, yeah, I, I can still get out here and do my thing against y'all. You know, y'all got all these heavyweights, these five stars, these four star recruits, and here we are three and two and one. And sometimes, you know, a couple of our players might not even have a star next to their <laughs> name, but, you know, we, we still went out there and had a ball doing it. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And what was your greatest? What was your greatest failure of college? Greatest failure greatest was failure. not finishing. My greatest failure was not uh, completing my college career or getting my degree. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. said that was my biggest failure. I got you. I got you. So one well, day, one day, I got to address that. Well, that kind of leads me to my next question: What was the biggest lesson you learned in college? Biggest lesson I learned, man, was to see it through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You no, know, that was the biggest lesson right there. 
But I hear you. You know, so you did all four years in college, correct? No, nah, two years. So just two years? Oh, okay. Yeah, just two and, years, and man. Bounced, and man. Cause I, yeah. I remember when uh, you was up at UCLA every day working out, uh, getting ready yeah. for the draft. Um, right. Talk about the NBA process. We'll actually talk about what made you go pro early and then go into the NBA process. Well, I, honestly, man, I, I was looking at, you know, staying in school for three years, four at the most, depending on my progress. And uh, the school screwed over Coach Adams. And, you know, I'm a loyal I'm a loyal dude, man. And like I said, the way that this guy was, what he meant for us as student athletes, mm -hmm. you know, he, he was a great guy, man. And he didn't deserve to get done dirty like that. And uh, so what, what ended up happening is Howie Dickerman, who was the assistant coach, at UConn at the time, they hired him because he was an alumnus of the school, and uh, he was also oh, best friends. And he was also best friends with the athletic director. So, you know, they bring in Howie, and Howie calls a meeting with myself and my family. And uh, so my mom flies out from from LA. My grandparents are there. They, you know, they're in Hartford, so they make the drive up. My dad, you know, a couple of aunts and uncles. And he, he told them that, you know, he was going to center everything around me and go through me with everything with the team. And mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. he said, if Keith stays, you know, I guarantee in two years, he'll be ready for the NBA. He'll be a draft pick, you know, a first round draft pick. And he, he promised us that he was going to keep uh, one or two of the assistant coaches um, just to make the transition easier for us, mm -hmm. you know. And so I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, if he's going to promise my family this, then all right, let's see. Man, the very next day, he fired everybody. And he so, fired everybody the next day? Fired, yeah, the next day, bro, he fired everybody. So, you know, how can I trust you if you lie to me one day and then, you know, do something completely different, you know, the next day? So I started, you know, making plans to get up out of there. Coach Greenberg had left to South Florida by this by this time. So I'm thinking about South Florida because I love Coach Greenberg. And, you know, Dre is still doing his thing at um uh, at Utah, Utah, even though they got Mike Doliak at the time. I'm like, Shh, I can slide to the four. Mike can be the five, you know, mm -hmm. since I'm such a versatile player. And uh what happened was, man. They, they messed up my transcripts so that I couldn't leave, you know, trying to bogart me in the stand. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So that ticked me off even more, man. And I said, well, bump it. I guess I'm just going to have to leave school and go back home. Right. So that's what I did for six months. And then, you know, somebody got in touch with me and I played in the summer pro league, mm -hmm. you know, for one of the free agent squads. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I went undrafted. Then the next year, which would have been my junior year, I entered the draft again. I'm going, you know, Philly's calling, Seattle's calling, talking about they're going to get me. And so I make the rounds going to all the pre-draft camps and everything. I'm in Chicago as well and uh, getting after it with everybody. I go undrafted, you know, but the trip part was on draft night. Philly and Seattle, the same two teams calling me, telling me that they're going to pick me. Right. So I'm looking at all these dudes get picked. And, you know, I go past, you know, everybody just passed me up. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I said, man, if I ever get a chance to get to the league, they're going to have to pay for it, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the L.A. Lakers fortunately gave me a chance. So they added me to their summer pro league team with Kobe, mm -hmm. Derek Fisher. Ace Custis out of Virginia Tech, James Forrest out of Georgia Tech, uh, Jimmy King out of Michigan, you know, mm -hmm. Shea Seals out of Shea Seals out of Tulsa. Man, we had we had a squad, you know what I'm I saying? I remember that. I was there in Long Beach. I was in high school. Like everybody, it was packed because it was like Kobe's first game, quote unquote, Derek Fisher, Kobe, all yeah. that. The high yeah. school. Team. I remember so, that team. I remember that team. Yeah, man. And so, you know, they gave me a chance to do my thing and show what I had. And I went out there putting in work inside right. out off the dribble, 
you know, dunking on fools, jaying them, crossing them. You know, they really allowed me to showcase my talent. Mm -hmm. And uh, Elgin Baylor was sitting with Coach Fitch, Bill Fitch, after one of the games, me and Kobe, we were about to walk up to our family. And uh, Coach Fitch stops me and says, son, if you're not signed with anybody at the end of this summer, you're going to be in the L.A. Clippers uniform. And so I'm like, all right, cool. I appreciate it, Coach. I, look, I grew up a Lakers fan. I was a diehard Lakers fan. <laughs> you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was my favorite player. I'm mm -hmm. tall, light-skinned like him. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I had a hook shot as well. I wore number 33 because of him. Right, you know? right. So me and Kobe turned around and walk away, and I'm like, yeah, right, fool. It's the Lakers. You know, I'm not even understanding or knowing that the Lakers roster is already set. Right, so if they right. were to invite me to camp, it would just be as a crash dummy, you know, ah, nothing more. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So uh, after the summer pro league was over, I went and joined up with the Portland Trail Blazers in the Rocky Mountain Review in Salt Lake City, mm -hmm. the Utah Jazz summer pro league. Mm -hmm. Now I'm with Jermaine O'Neal, Kelvin Cato, Corey Beck, Antonio Wingfield, you know, and a couple other cats, and I'm playing. The, I'm rotating between the three, four, and five, depending on, you know, if we go big with myself, Cato, and Jermaine, you know. They were going to that? That would be the front line? Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, 7, 3, 6, 10, and 6, 11. So, no, both of them are 6, 11. So, 7, 3, and 2, 6, 11s, and I've been yeah, playing I, was, I, remember, I remember Cato. I remember both. Him yeah. And him. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm the most versatile one out of the three. So they throw, they slide me out on the perimeter, you okay. know, and then I go down and, you know, and I post up sometimes too, you know, take advantage of the mismatches. And, you know, we was calling ourselves triple threat. We getting, <laughs> yeah. we, we getting our clown on, man. You know, one of us is backing down our man, somebody else with back door. We just toss it over our shoulder for a lob, you know, no look lob to, to each other, just clowning and having a good time. Right, but, uh, right, 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 right. It's over. When that was over, man, the, you know, uh, I had three or four contract offers from Denver, uh, Seattle, the Clippers, and um, I can't remember who the other one was from. But uh, I know Denver wanted wanted to give me a two year deal for like mm -hmm. two and a half million, mm -hmm. and then uh. Seattle wanted to give me the the uh the minimum, which was two thirty at the time, two thirty two. Mm -hmm. And then the Clippers, the Clippers, um, they came at me, you know, five years, eight point four million. And you know, I couldn't believe it, man. I'm I'm like, whoa! So I'm pinching myself, you know, to see if it's real, right? You know, because right. they gave I you that off the, off the rip, huh? The five point yeah, I mean, yeah. five year deal off the rip, okay. Yeah, as an undrafted rookie free agent. And That's that was crazy. unheard of. That was yeah, unheard it of at the time. Like it. it didn't seem like it, yeah. Yeah, because I'm I, that's the same money that the number four pick got that year. Oh you know wow. What I'm yeah, so I was just as, you know, I may as well have been a number four pick at a draft <laughs> if I want to get that money. You feel me? I and, got um, you. So I signed with the Clippers. I, I get to stay home at the crib. You know, mom get to come to the games, brothers and sisters, you know, family. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I ain't got to move or nothing except to my own, you know, to my own spot. So, hey, but, man, let me tell you, a lot of players don't understand the politics, the political side of professional basketball. No Ooh, idea, man. man. No idea. Yeah. And they don't know that some of these coaches, man, they, they really get at you real foul and reckless. And uh, I had to experience a little bit of that. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't handle it the best way because I didn't have a veteran leadership to guide me through it. You know, what I got in return when I asked one of my vets, you know, what I'm supposed to do about the way they're getting at me. Well, I don't know what to tell you, young fella. You're going to have to figure it out, young fella, because everybody's looking at each other as competition for that next big contract. You know, that's right around. You got to remember, man, those are the days when. You know, the first mega deals of 40 and $50 million. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So nobody was really, everybody was really more concerned with getting their bag rather than okay. giving giving a young cat some, some guy. Mm -hmm. so much nah, right? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I'm left to my own devices, mm -hmm. which is either fight or flight, and I'm a fighter. So I'm getting back at, you know, I'm getting back at the staff, and they punishing me by putting me on injured reserve, you know, or I got a whole bunch of DMPs, you know. So I just sat down at the end of the bench and just chilled and, you know, watched us get our butts kicked out there. <laughs> you know? um, and, you know, with pro basketball, they got scouting reports of every team and every player and their likes and dislikes. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. study those scouting reports just in case they're going to throw me out there because I, I want to be able to, you know, play my opponent to his weaknesses mm -hmm. to give us the best chance to win. You know, we were students of the game like that. And um, and I could I, I would just sit there and I would read players from the bench and, you know, pretty much know what I would do to, you know, try to stop this cat. You mm -hmm. know, so when I did get my opportunity, they not they not getting really anything against me. You know what I'm saying? And offensively, I was told that they don't want me to score. You know, I can shoot. They don't want me to shoot jump shots. You know, I'm great on pick and pop because I'm taking those big slow dudes away from the basket. I can go right past them. Right, dunk right. On whoever they four man is or whoever rotates, you know. Uh, it's true. You know, and fortunately, they had enough sense to play me at the three a few times. So I'm guarding Mike my rookie year, you know, in Chicago. And he got to guard me. And you, you see Ron Harper guard me, you know. I'm taking them to the block. Oh, okay. I, okay. What's up now? Yeah. You know, <laughs> dunking on them, getting my little hook shot off on them, you know, my little turnaround and whatnot. And uh, there was one game against the Cleveland Cavaliers with Big Zadrunas Hilgoskis. And the coach comes and gets me. And as he's walking me to the scorer's table to check, to check in, he says, now look, all I want you to do is rebound, block shots, play defense. I don't want you to do anything else. Mm -hmm. And I'm so I look back at the bench, you know, at the guys, and they just give me this look. So you know what that means? Get out there and do your thing, you know? <laughs> so I go out there, man. I go six for six real quick. I'm in my bag, inside out, crossing people, you know, dunking on people. The next dead ball, the coach is at half court coming to get me cuss me out all the way to the end of the bench because that's not what he wanted me to do. You know what I'm saying? I was expected to be like uh, like, DeAndre praise, George. like good job, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, right. But I was supposed to be like DeAndre Jordan. You know, only play your role, you know, catch an occasional lob, get, get it off the putbacks, you know, but play play solid defense. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's what they wanted. And um, I couldn't understand why they were handcuffing me. You know, wouldn't, I'm thinking, wouldn't you want your players to show what they can do, especially because they had given me, so, you know, that kind of money? It's like, okay, let me show why you gave me this money. You know, I wasn't like the other guys who were happy with just collecting a check. You know, there, there are a lot of guys that just sit there, man, I just sit there and collect a check. I'm mm -hmm. too much of a competitor, you know, right. and I love this game. And ball really was life for me. Mm -hmm. So when I wasn't able to play during the games, I'm playing at Venice Beach. I'm going everywhere just so I can play, you know. And uh, even during the season, you feel me? I, I risk injury just so I can play because I loved it that much, mm -hmm. you know. And I, and I had to stay ready for when they called my number. I got you. Know? you. But uh, a lot of guys, man, like the Clippers were just a different organization back then, you know. No, and, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it wasn't. It wasn't on us players. You know, us players, we wanted to win. We hated losing. We hated the positions that the organization put us in. You know, that that really had us looking bad. I mean, to go on a tonight show with Jay Leno after starting the season 0 and 17, and you know 0 and 18 would have tied the record for most losses to open up a season. So we went off first game and they invite us on the show, you know, clowning. I got an electric scoreboard that says only 17 and then it drops the number one. It turns to the <laughs> number one and they, they dropping balloons and confetti on us and playing music. You know, I'm sitting there pissed off on national TV again. 
you know, like, man, this dude really going to have us like, the, you know, like this clown in us. Right, right, you know, right, right. Some, some of the guys didn't care because they on Jay Leno. Yeah, yeah. I, I cared too much. You know, I love the game too much. So excuse me, you see me, you know, swiping at these mosquitoes. No, no, I get it. Yeah. I, I know Texas is like that, bro, so it's all good. <laughs> They tear my butt up, man. But, you know, <laughs> I got but on the real, man, I was just too much of a competitor. And um, if I did have the right kind of leadership around me, you know, things would have been different, you know, mm -hmm. because then I'd have somebody to, to pull me to the side and walk me through it and guide me through it, you know. And uh, so I've taken that role as an elder statesman of the game, you know, wherever I went after that. To, uh, to guide the younger players, you know, to keep them from falling into those traps uh, because that's real important. You know, well, the guys were falling. Yeah. I fell into a trap. And, um, you know, and I kept digging the hole deeper and deeper for myself. And uh, I couldn't just stand by and watch other, other players do that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm the one now that, you know, walks guys through these situations and helps them understand what they're going through and how to handle it the right way as a professional, you mm -hmm. know, from my own experiences, you feel me? And mm -hmm. I absolutely love it. And as a direct result of that, I have a great relationship with many, many young players out there, you know, who are playing all around the world. You know, they, they hit me up, ask, you know, let me know what's going on and we break it down, chop it up. And, you know, they still playing, they still doing the damn thing whether they're in the league or overseas. I got you. So how many years you play in the league? I played three years in the league. I got suspended my fourth year. You know, they uh, they told me not to come to training camp on media day. They told me not to come to training camp. And, you know, it was a trip because I had made up my mind that I wasn't going to allow none of, the, none of the BS to get to me. I was just going to stay focused on what I had to do because – we wanted to be, you know, we, we had to prove to everybody else that we were better than what we had been in the past. You know, mm -hmm. we got a new coach, Alvin Gentry. He got a great attitude, you know, and then don't come to training camp. We'll call We'll, we'll be in touch with you. And the funny thing is I'm sitting there with Jeff McInnes, Lamar, and, you know, the young guys, Q Rich, Darius, Elton, and, um, uh, we're hype, man, about the season, yeah. you know, and they send they send a reporter over to me who says, Keith, uh, it's been said that you're a real head case. What do you have to say to that? And he puts the microphone in my face, you know, and Jeff and those guys are like, wow, you really going to come over here and ask this man that? Right. I said, no, nah, it's OK. Sorry, bro. I said, yeah, well, you know, there are some situations that I didn't quite understand how to handle in the past, but, you know, I'm ready to to accept all challenges and, you know, really get out here and do what I have to do for the organization. And I'm just looking forward to having a great season, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, right after that is when they told me not to come to training camp. <laughs> so I, my agent, Sean Holly, he, he gets me a, a trainer so that now I'm working out six days a week, twice a day, you know. And um, I'm doing strength and conditioning. I'm doing basketball stuff. I'm not gaining any weight. At the time, I weighed 220 pounds. I'm still the same weight, you know, 21 years later. I'm still the <laughs> same weight, you know. And uh, then I would take a physical. i do the mm -hmm. same thing that the league was going to have me do. i pass that. Then i go and take the, the physical for the team and doing the same stuff I did the day before, and they would fail me. And, you know, I was trying to understand how I, how I could fail – the same test exactly a day after passing it, you know, and I'm, I'm getting the same numbers as guards because again, I played year round. So I was in the best, I was always in shape, you know, right, but they right, suspended right. me for the season and told the media that I was out of shape. And so I go get another physical from another doctor. They would pass me. Then I go the next day to the Clippers who would fail me. They did this four times to me. And uh, the fourth time I asked the doctor, I said, why are you guys doing this to me? What's going on? You know, I just did this stuff yesterday. I said, I always take a physical doing the same stuff the day before I come in to see you. 
I said, I, they passed me, but you failed me. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I said, I got the same numbers every time, but you're failing me. Why right. is that? And he said, well, Keith, that's between your agent and Andy Roser, you know, who was in the front office. So that's between them. You got to talk to them about it. So I knew that they had it in for me and they're trying to blackball me. You know, I had a chance to sign a, a big time contract, you know, with another organization. I was going to get a $60 million contract. So, you know, I had asked them to release me, you know, just release me so I can go do what I got to do because mm -hmm. you guys aren't allowing me to grow. You just hold me back. And uh, they called me one night when I was at dinner with my, with my fiance. And they told me, they said, Keith, we heard about that contract you got, you know, that, that you got offered. That's a nice contract. Well, here's the thing. We're not going to let you get it. You know, they said, uh, you haven't earned it, and we don't think you deserve it. Wow. So, uh, so the next day, that's when it went to the press that they suspended me for the season and, and you know, for being out of shape. And, you know, all my peers, man, they knew it was some BS. Mm -hmm. But uh, what can we do when you're dealing with a juggernaut of an organization, you know, and um, from a juggernaut of a league, you know, we mm -hmm. weren't as powered as – we weren't as empowered back then as the players are today. No, of course, of course, of course. They can go ahead and pretty much say whatever they want about you and it's gospel to the rest of the league, you mm -hmm. know, and – um. Man, they went so far as to say that I was smoking crack and that that's why I wasn't gaining any weight. I ain't been, I ain't had no weight on me since I was like six months old, you know, right. with, with the with the little chubby cheeks. I got pictures <laughs> of food and everything after that. I was stretched out and thin, you know. I, I was nothing but shoulders, elbows, and kneecaps. No, you know I got what I'm you. Saying? I got you. And so I, I, that really put me in a really deep, dark depression, man, and I. I basically just had a, a liquid um, diet. All I did from sunup to sundown was drink, you know, mm -hmm. and my attitude just, just went out the door, man. And it was like, I just didn't care anymore. Like I had given up, you know, something that I had worked so hard towards, you know, had been snatched away from me in such a cruel way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really struggled with handling it, you know, uh, but I'm, I'm grateful for those experiences because, again, that set me in a position, the position that I'm in today, being able to mentor so many different players around the world so that when they deal with similar circumstances, they know a, a better way to handle it, you know? I got you. So you played in the NBA for the three years, obviously went through some troubles towards the end. Uh, did you go overseas after? Yeah, I went to Italy, man, and um, I went to Naples, Italy, and, you know, I got my own way over there because, you know, I'm, I used to love smoking weed, and <laughs> they, they tested me. They tested me one day, and, I, you know, I failed the test because, of, you know, I tested positive for marijuana, so they thanked me for my time, gave me a, a plane ticket home, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah, overseas, I'm, that's they don't play like that, man. They, they you know, yeah. they don't yeah. play. Yeah, and so, you know, that one was on me. You know, and uh, I had I ended up playing, you know, in the CBA, the USBL. I played for Daryl Dawkins in the USBL, the United States Basketball League. At the time, that was the top semi-pro league, you mm -hmm. know, underneath. You know, after the NBA, you had the USBL, you know, because the CBA had fallen off a bit. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to play with guys like Kareem Reed, Tim Wynn. Ace Custis again, you know, um, Tunji Awajobi out of Boston University, Chance mm -hmm. Roberson, Corey Hightower, you know, just to name a few of those guys. And um, we won a, C, you know, a USBL championship. Odin Polonese played with us one year. We lost in the, you know, the championship game to, to Kareem, to Kareem's, no, was it Kareem or was it a Cliff Levinston squad? But, you know, we, we had talent in that league, dudes who had, you know, league talent, but right, just yeah. didn't get the opportunity, you know? And, uh, I'm, hey, after that, I played in the, in the CBA, then I went over to China and played in the CBA, you know? Because I would say, like, uh, 
keep it like, like you're not, you, you didn't ever really hang it up, you know, because I'd be like, oh, keeps up over here, still playing, he's, he's hooping here, he's hooping there. You was, you never really hung it up and said, I'm retired from ball. He was always, seemed like he was always still playing. Yeah, you know, man, because ball, because ball was life. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that was what like, that's what my passion was. Still, still hooping in China, man, or uh, Philippines or wherever. I was like, man, he's still hooping. Yeah, yeah. A couple of weeks ago, man, I was down in Mexico playing in a tournament. Yeah, you know, so, I'm 45 so, like, years I, I, old. so I can't even ask you would you hang it up because you really didn't never hang it up. Right, right. You know? And you know, a young man that I had mentored, you know, some time back when he was a rookie, Jermaine Barnes. Um, he ended up getting hurt. And, you know, he had a career ending injury. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this dude started his own pro league in, in the South called the UBA, the Universal Basketball Association. And, uh, you know, what he started doing was creating avenues for players to get overseas, you know, through his league. And uh, he, he, he created Euro basket profiles for these dudes with all their stats, all the film from games, all the things that these players need, you know, and. He started creating these FIBA uh, certified basketball tournaments internationally, you know, in Spain and France and the Dominican Republic. You know, I played for Team USA in the William Jones Cup in, in Taiwan several years ago, you know, and uh, I've won. I've been fortunate enough to win four gold medals. You know, I was supposed to go back down to the Dominican Republic uh, next month to play with these guys and try to win my fifth gold medal. But passport came up missing you know and uh so i i gotta get a new passport that prevented me from going to get my fifth gold medal at 45 years old you know <laughs> but i instead man i'm blessed with another opportunity to play for the utah valor and the tbt you know that's coming up next month so uh I got you. i'm gonna i'm gonna team up with my former aau teammate aaron maxi one more time to do that you know, we've got some pretty I saw good that. guys. I saw, I saw that. I saw yeah. That. You know, Marquise Marshall, who's the son of NBA legend Danielle Marshall. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris mm -hmm. Jones, who's a who's a sniper, you know, and uh and a host of other, you know, good talent. So I'm just really looking forward to that getting out there and, you know, trying to win that million dollar pot. I hate, you, bro. I hate. You. All right, all right. Well, like I said, your career is not net necessarily finished. It's still ongoing, you know. Yeah, um, I tried to retire. I tried to retire, bro, <laughs> and, and just focus on, like, you know, my, my youth basketball program. But they still calling for me to get out there because of the fact that I stay ready. No, I got you. All right. Well, I got two more questions, and then we'll call it. All right? First question is, like, obviously, when you were in that low point of your life, you know, with the, with the, uh, with the liquid stuff, um how did you get out of it you know how did you kind of transition yourself to get out of that uh, bad bad space man honestly um coach john lucas called me one day and you know he's as real as they get and you know he says some words that i'm that i'm not going to repeat on the platform you know <laughs> he basically checked he basically checked me and uh he came at me hard, man. Came at me real, and he said, "Boss, I'm tired of seeing you waste waste away in these in these lower levels. We we gonna get you back where you're supposed to be." Mm -hmm. You know, he says, "So I'm gonna bring you down here to Houston, and we are gonna get you right, and uh, we gonna get you back in the league." Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. I get down to Houston. I'm, you know, I hadn't drank in six months by this time, but I'm still smoking weed, and uh. I'm, I'm training twice a day, six days a week with Coach Lucas and a few other cats who are still trying to get back in the league or overseas. Steve Francis, Sam Mack, Damon St Stoudemire, you know, the name of uh, um, Nudie Eby, you know, mm -hmm. to name a few of those guys. And uh, we just getting after it every day, you know, mm -hmm. twice a day. I ended up getting sick during lunch and uh, – you know, I got temporary blindness, hot and cold sweats, projectile vomiting, um, hyperventilation. And he's thinking that I have been, you know, sneaking in some drinks. Right. right, right. You know, I hadn't drank at all, you know. And uh, 
and I hadn't even smoked since the day before I left to go out there. So I was straight, you know what I'm saying? And really just focused. And uh, he took me to a sober living, man. And I couldn't even fill out the registration paper because I was in such a bad way. And they put me in a, in a first phase house. And uh, an hour later, man, I'm on the back. I'm in the back of an ambulance being rushed to the hospital. You know, I don't even really remember the ambulance. I remember seeing a pair of, I, it was so bad, bro, that I couldn't breathe. And I'm coming out of my clothes. Mm -hmm. And I'm following the breeze from the open door, you know, because I'm gasping for air and I got to get outside to get more air. And, you know, my vision's all messed up from the temporary blindness. And I'm crawling on the floor, coming out of everything. And I see a pair of black, ashy feet and some sandals, you know, and some air Moses. And I hear, man, you know, I hear a voice say, somebody called 911. Right. And I said, and I said, I knew God was black. And that was, and I guess I fell out after that. But I came to in the hospital on life support two days later, you know, and so that tripped me out. You know, I'm plugged up to all these machines, got mm -hmm. these tubes in and out of me. So I start yanking everything up out and um, scratched up my larynx in the process. And so the machines are going off because they thinking that I died. So it's just showing a flat line on the machine, you know? And so they rush in with the crash cart and I'm sitting up, you know, in the bed, which tripped them out. They said, what are you doing? And I asked them, you know, how did I get here? What's going on? What happened? Mm -hmm. The doctor mm -hmm. said, uh, we almost lost you in an emergency room. You've been here two days ago. So we had to put you on life support to keep you alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the reality check for me right there, man. That's when I finally had to admit to my innermost self that, you know, I had a serious problem. You know, um, because what sent me there was pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis. Okay. And so uh, as a direct result of my drinking. So when, when he told me, you know, what, every, what everything was, you know, about, mm -hmm. that's when I made that decision. Yeah, I can't ever touch that stuff again. And I really just got to get myself, you know, I got to get myself together. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a seven-year-old son and I got to be there to raise my son. You know, I got nieces and nephews that I got to that I got to, you know, give guidance to and uh, who better than me than their uncle. So I, I got to get it together. And, right. you know, I got I got out of the hospital after a week. I'm on a restricted diet. You know, greasy foods triggered the pancreatitis because mm -hmm. um, it happened to me several times before I had quit drinking. And I thought it was alcohol poisoning or something but it was actually the greasy foods that were doing me in. So right. along with, the, you know, from the consumption. So, uh, man, I, I'm going to 12 step meetings every day, several times a day, getting my body, you know, my body, mind and spirit. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, I haven't looked back, you know, so now I, I had the fortune of, you know, being drafted by the Tulsa 66 as a coach, Joy Meyer, of the D league, you know, which is now the G league. And, uh, you know, he, he came in and saw me during the workout after I had gotten myself together and, um, he was impressed enough to give me a shot, you know? And, uh, unfortunately the NBA, they weren't so forgiving. So even though when I got my opportunities in the, in the D league, you know, where I got substantial minutes, I made the, most of it where I'm scoring mm -hmm. double digits, you know, I'm averaging close to double digit rebounds and I'm one of the leading shot blockers in the league. You know, they didn't want to give me an opportunity. So, yeah. uh, you know, and another thing that, that was kind of frustrating about it is I wasn't one of the guys that was sent down by the league. So I had mm -hmm. to sit behind, you know, Nick Fazekas. Even though I knew I was better than him, I got to sit behind him because the league sent him there to get that work. So right. he had to get those minutes, you know, and uh, more politics of the game that right. I had to adjust to, mm -hmm. you know. And fortunately for me, Aaron Swenson was one of our assistant coaches. He's a former player, you know, played at Auburn and played a lot of years overseas. 
And so finally, for the first time, I got that vent, that guidance that I needed from, from, you know, a veteran player who's now a coach mm -hmm. to walk me through and show me how to handle the adversity that I was dealing with, you know? And so I, I just stayed and made the best out of it and, you know, and took advantage of the opportunities that they gave me, you know, um, the league never came knocking again and I'm okay with that. Um, you know, there's some things that you got to accept in life. And that was one of them for me, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I just go back to playing in the CBA, the ABA and, you know, over in China. Nice. Like I said, man, you probably had the longest career I've ever known for anybody. Everybody else is retired. You be still making money here and there, bro. It's hilarious. I'll be like, yo, man, Keith ain't oh, never no. gonna retire, bro. We 50 out there still crossing people over and dunking. Hey, God willing, if I'm if I'm still able to, then that's what it is, you know. <laughs> but look at JR. JR just JR Henderson. He just, just he retired. just retired. Just retired. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so yo, like, he just that's retired. a dude. That's a dude right. that the NBA really messed up on. You know, they got it wrong with JR because he was. I tell beast. anybody this, dude, like people don't know. He was the hardest dude I ever played against in college. Six eight, six nine, can could play every shoot. position, can Physical. guard every position. He yep. could dribble, he could shoot. You know, I, I just tweeted the other day just a random memory about how he dunked on me at double pump camp. <laughs> it's funny because I had I had uh, spiked the ball when he went up, but I had spiked it right back into his hands, and he just, bah, you know, brought it down on me. I'm like, oh, you know. <laughs> like, man, I, I said, I still ain't forgiving him for that. No, but, I got you. you. Know, I got you. I got he, you. he was the first dude to ever dunk on me, you mm -hmm. know, in high school. The next dude, the second dude was Tony Gonzalez. Okay, you know? okay. Well, there yeah. you go. At least yeah. you got one NBA dude, one NFL dude, so yeah. Right, you know, right. Yeah. yeah, but JR is one of those dudes that should have been in the league, man. They should have had a oh, 15, yeah. man, you he, know, 15 he'd plus. He's a perfect dude right now. He's a perfect player for the NBA right now. Oh, he's man. Nine, handle, shoot, pass. He's like right. Ben Simmons with a jumper. Right, right, right. And you know. And so, well, and let me, you, let me, you, let me let you call everything. Um, uh, like what, what you got going on? What, what, what you got going out there? Right now, I'm I'm in the process of building my youth basketball program, the Cloth Stars Elite, um, mm -hmm. located in Mansfield, Texas. And, uh, you know, I'm really just trying to give these kids the opportunities that most people wouldn't give them and, and, and teach them the right way to play the game of basketball through the fundamentals. Everybody mm -hmm. thinks that it's all about athleticism, and that's because – you know, people are relying more on athleticism today than the regular fundamentals. And mm -hmm. uh, I had to get back to that. You know, when I would come home from China, because I was coaching youth basketball in China, head coach of Brothers Hoops in Shanghai. And uh, when I would come home on business, I would go check out the AAU scene. And there weren't really many teachers of the game out there. Mm -hmm. It's like they just got the best players together or the most athletic players together and throw them out there on the court, you know, and just let them go at it. Yep. Nobody was, you know, there weren't any teachers. So yep. I said, okay, let me come home man, and teach these kids how to really play, you know, so that they have a better chance of having a nice long, you know, because I'm looking more off the court, you mm -hmm. know, with this for these kids by introducing them to the game on an international level. And, mm -hmm. uh, helping them form relationships that are going to last a lifetime with a kid that barely speak English or you can't even understand their language. But the way that social media is set up a FaceTime and all these different things, you know, kids are like-minded in the things that they want to do. And so by the time they're done with me and done with college, if they go, you know, if they choose to play college ball, if they don't make it to the pros, that's cool. They could be a professional in another area of life whether it's being a dentist, whether it's being a surgeon, whether it's being a businessman or a businesswoman, you know, and, and bringing them up in my organization and my program and having them play internationally, you know, we're building international business opportunities for these kids, you know. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that growing up. We didn't go no. overseas until Man. we were grown. Or unless, 
we well, came well, from. Money. I'm 11, 10, 11, 12, whatever the age is. I'm going overseas. That's a, that's a that's a journey of a lifetime, man. Yeah. And so, you know, I've got programs from Asia to Africa and Europe who are contacting me even now that that, you know, they're like, hey, get your stuff right and you know, we'll we'll set something up with the travel agents and we'll get you guys out here. We'll bring your program out here so that the kids can compete and then we'll come to the states where you're at and right. you know, do the same thing. And I'll be able to introduce, you know, that to the local programs as well, just to give all the kids some exposure to that. You know That's what I'm saying? Thing, man. That's gonna be crazy. I give you yeah, more respect. Yeah. More respect. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Yep, yep, you should. It's tight. It's real tight. I need to put my son on your team. <laughs> <laughs> Bring him on out here. You know I got it. Right, right. Well, once again, thank you, Keith, man, for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it, man. Your knowledge in for the game and just everything that's going on. I I appreciate you so much for coming on. Everybody, uh, you know, all my fans who are watching the show, everybody appreciate it because I was like. Keith got a long story because he got NBA overseas. He's still he's still kind of playing low key. So yeah. like I said, just want to say thank you, bro. I appreciate you. Much love always. You know, we thank you, man. be talking to you always, man. Thank you. It was an honor and a privilege, man. I greatly appreciate the opportunity. Oh, no problem, man. Well, like I said, we see y'all next week on the Athlete's Journey. I'm your host, Travis Street, and I'm out. Special guest, shout out to my boy Keith Claus. One love. All right, peace.